Hello and welcome to the Currency Exchange, Not West Markets FX podcast, where we break down the major themes and events driving currency markets this week and in the weeks ahead. Today I'm joined by Alvaro Vivanco, our head of ESG strategy and emerging market macro strategy. Alvaro, you put out a new piece that looks further down the line at emerging market fiscal sustainability. You made the point that, you know, we've all been kind of upset about, you know, the monetary policy repercussions of um, post-COVID, but actually maybe what we've overlooked and what could be a game changer in the longer term is actually the fiscal policy repercussions of the pandemic. And um, what were kind of your main findings when you looked across the EM space? Uh, hi, Emer. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining this week. Uh, yes, you know, I think it's been interesting just the last couple of uh, days that the market is shifting a little bit, right? There's been a little bit of dollar strength over the last few sessions, but really without any triggers, right? It seems like it's a little bit of, especially on the EM side, profit cre- uh, profit taking, people being a little bit more cautious about the levels. And then, as we mentioned last time we did this together, a little bit of pushback from investors about this idea that the local fixing income flow will come to the rescue for EM currencies. So I think that, you know, the next few days and weeks perhaps is a little bit of a transition period. So as you said, what we have done is look a little bit beyond that. There's been a lot of talk and discussion uh, about what the EM central bankers are about to do. And, uh, you know, there's been some interesting developments in places like Hungary that maybe we can touch upon later. But in this piece that we just put out, we do exactly what you said is, you know, let's compare where we are in emerging markets uh, in terms of debt, uh, public debt to GDP ratios compared to the pandemic. And in general, kind of the good and the bad news is that debt for emerging markets went up, uh, in some cases significantly, but it is still for the average uh, of the liquid countries that we cover at relatively manageable levels. We don't think that this is something to be uh, overly worried about as a credible thing. But then we get into, into some of the details and that's where some of these bigger underperformers have been. And, you know, I want to kind of pass the question to you because South Africa really comes across as as the one that uh, not only has been a huge jump, uh, not only from 2018, but really, you know, over the last couple of decades, right? Um, And it's expected to continue. But also in terms of the absolute levels, they're reaching kind of dangerous, um, dangerous levels compared to the rest of emerging markets and, and just by themselves, right? We're talking about levels above 80, 90% of, of GDP over the next few years. So maybe you can, and this is you know, in, in line with your current views of being a little bit more defensive on, on South Africa than some of the peers, but you know, what have been the drivers? What do you expect um, you know, the fiscal to look like in South Africa at a high level for the next few few years? Yeah, I have to say the difficult thing is that it's not for a lack of, you know, um, fiscal will. It's not for a lack of trying that policymakers kind of recognize the escalation that we've seen in debt and the risk to it. Um, but they're all kind of, they lack the political kind of credibility to push through reform. So I think very clear in that kind of rapid escalation of debt is the fact that they have continued end liability um, to some of the state-owned enterprises. I know the last budget they outright took onto their balance sheet some of the state energy providers' debt, uh, so basically creating a step change in the fiscal debt profile. And also, kind of, um, you know, the political leverage that trade unions have um, within South Africa. A big issue for the South Africa um, budget is that increasingly wage expenditure just is an increasing proportion of overall outgoings. Um, and unfortunately, I think things are going to get worse instead of better. Obviously, South Africa suffered from ongoing electricity rationing because they can't create enough electricity to meet uh, demand. That obviously requires more um, expenditure in the short term and hopefully more investment in building back up electricity supply. But really, the hope for South Africa was that you get more private sector involvement in these sectors that have you know, traditionally been um, 
be within the public sphere and that also they'd be able to access concessional financing for Western leaders. And I think at the start of this year, two things really changed that. They were greatly listed for corruption, um, which is kind of a red flag and kind of um, makes them subject to extra regulatory checks when it comes to financing. Um, but also they did kind of military drills, um, unfortunately, at the, the anniversary of the Ukraine war with Russia and China. So I think, you know, those kind of uh, strained diplomatic ties will really go against South Africa when they look for other sources of financing. So unfortunately, I think it's going to get worse as opposed to better. We're kind of throwing it back to you. I know actually your region, um, fiscal are looking on the upside. You know, if you think of Brazil, I know um, fiscal definitely focus at the moment. And you see a big pushback against uh, holes for more fiscal expenditure. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's been a great, very interesting co- contrast, right? Uh, Brazil have been managed their debt levels relatively well. You know, there's always been kind of the concern from investors that the fiscal is about to explode in Brazil. We did see the reaction to the pandemic, debt to GDP did increase, but the efforts of the current administration are very much in line with what we have seen over the last few years, which is let's try to put as many uh, claws on expenditures as possible. It has not always worked, but where we're seeing just this week is uh, again the the new government, you know, trying to test the market in some ways of how much new subsidies and how much expenditures they can get away with. But at the same time, the market pushing back and finding that equilibrium, and then some concern from the government in terms of trying to uh, obviously keep the market open if the level of, of rates are relatively stable. So what's interesting, right, is that compared to South Africa, um, the debt trajectory of Brazil is a lot more moderate. And just over the last two years, South Africa has actually surpassed Brazil on debt, uh, net debt to, to GDP, which is something that is, is very important. We think that, you know, there, there are repercussions for the currency, as you mentioned, there are repercussions for the longer end of the curve. The other country that sometimes I think people forget is is Mexico, right? And Mexico did a fantastic job. In contrast to these concerns that we all had with AMLO coming into power a few years back, uh, not only was the response to the pandemic smaller and more moderate, but actually debt decreased between 2016 and 2019. So it was almost as if Mexico kind of knew that this was coming. They did their homework. Uh, They put in place a relatively tight fiscal policy and then that allowed to have some moderate reaction to COVID. And now, uh, you know, for the next five to 10 years, debt ratios are, um, you know, forecasted to remain very, very uh, stable. So, you know, in a way, Mexico is looking a lot more like Poland, right? And Poland, uh, by the way, has also been a significant outperformer in terms of their debt management. So. Things are happening. I think that, you, you know, for some time, the reaction has been from the market has been more about uh, inflation, more about the carry and the policy rates. But we're seeing that th- this huge divergence between countries and regions in terms of their fiscal. And, you know, we have a very short report with a couple of charts that uh, lays down those those facts. Um, before we go, let me uh, ask you about Hungary and what happened this week, because you know, we have been highlighting the importance of central banks being conservative and hawkish, and then we had a little bit of a surprise from Hungary. What do you expect? Yeah, I, you know, we kept pointing out that central banks had been quite defensive, but I would say that uh, in terms of emerging market central banks, Hungary is kind of known to be the outlier. Um, you know, they introduced um, kind of emergency policy settings back in October last year, and we very much aimed at um, supporting a stronger currency. It was interesting when we got you know, kind of very dovish comments coming out from um, the central bank spokesperson, always committing uh, to reducing some of the corridor rates and next week's meeting. And um, they kind of made some throwaway comments about the fact that inflation was easing and, and going lower. But in context, the hungry inflation is at 25.2%. And it's only about half a percentage point below its recent peak. Um, and you know, these are really at odds with kind of um, previous statement made by the central bank. We think the real trigger was the fact that Hungarian foreign 
traded at a year high against the euro on the previous day. And basically, the central bank had achieved a it achieved currency strength. Uh, the effective policy rate is 18%. Uh, we think they're going to shift back to orthodox, orthodoxy. So effectively, bring that rate back in line with the benchmark rate, which is 13%. So that does imply 500 basis points of rate cuts when inflation is extremely high. Um, and also, you know, it will be the first kind of tradable emerging market central bank to really start cutting rates and want to add the, the inflation kind of justifiably and uh, warranting it. Uh, so we do think there is um, big depreciation rate coming for Hungary. I would say kind of two saving graces um, is the fact that we do think they'll calibrate the rate of, of policy easing to the currency's performance. And um, so while they may start with 100 basis point rate cut, we think they'll be very sensitive to the extent of uh, of depreciation after that. We've also said and kind of committed to announcing those policy decisions at the scheduled monetary policy meetings, even though kind of um, within their T's and C's, they could actually announce it on a daily basis. But I think, you know, the kind kind of, um, kind of dissuade from all the time, we do think that up will trade significantly lower against the euro. I don't think it will be a slow pace of depreciation. Uh, so as we say, we have massive kind of divergence, both in terms of fiscal policy um, and monetary policy within emerging markets. So certainly lots of opportunities and lots of also risk to be a cognizant of. Well, I guess that about sums it up. Alvar, thank you so much for joining us today and taking us through your report. And if you do like the podcast, please do click like. And also remember to subscribe so you can get the latest episode first. Thanks for joining us.